Thank you very much. This is always the uh, worst time of the day to, uh, thank you, to uh, present because everyone's ready for naps. But uh, I'll try to uh, keep this a little, uh, little entertaining. I have a couple of videos to share with you as well as uh, a little, uh, we're going to play a little game here in a, in a little bit. But um, we'll start with uh, uh, cognitive computing. And there's been a lot of great discussion today about big data, unstructured data, you know, the speed of data, analytics, and a lot of really interesting viewpoints shared. Hopefully this will build on uh, what's been uh, talked about so far today. And to sort of tee this up, we're going to go back in the Wayback Machine again one more time. But uh, this video does a really good job of putting the problem that um, Jeff talked about uh, of cognitive computing in context. So this was actually produced just prior, it's not about Jeopardy, but it's produced just prior to the Jeopardy event and sort of uh, uh, explains this a little bit. This is IBM research and we're supposed to be pushing the limits of science. I mean, that's our job, to look for exploratory challenges that help us drive science. There's two types of innovation. There's incremental innovation improving existing products and advancing them in sort of a linear fashion. But we like to present our teams, and our teams even generate for themselves, grand challenges. So what makes a grand challenge is, first of all, it has to be difficult, right? It has to be a challenge. It has to be inspiring. Chess was a grand challenge that was identified in the 60s. People said that a, no computer will ever beat a human chess grandmaster. It would be a landmark to show that we understood computer technology well enough to take on this task that we thought was really restricted to human intelligence. And we did it with Deep Blue. Another grand challenge is around using computers to map the human genome. We call the computer Blue Gene. Blue for IBM, Gene for Genomics. We encourage people to work across disciplines on these grand challenges. And it's these sorts of things that produce the big breakthroughs that IBM has done for the past 100 years. Language is an area where, from the very beginning of the computer era, people kept expecting computers to do reasonably well at it. They expected computers could talk. They could understand what it is you're asking for, and then they can do that thing, or they can answer that thing. And so far, the computers have failed to deliver on this promise. There's something called open question answering that has been a problem in computer science from the beginning. It's much more difficult than search. It's not about a single keyword. It's much more the way normal humans communicate. Humans communicate very fluently in images, in literature, in writing. People get natural language because it's a human artifact. They relate those words and those phrases and those ideas back to the way they think. They ground that information in human cognition, their human experience. But that's not written in a formal database language or a formal mathematical language that computers can understand. Computers are used to unambiguous things. Human language, completely the opposite. Last night, uh, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How it got in my pajamas, I'll never know. We know what the pajamas are modifying, but the computer, it's just as likely that the elephant's wearing pajamas. And that's where computers struggle dramatically, and that's where we want to make them better. IBM executives are really interested in doing sort of the next big grand challenge, the next deep blue. Do you have any questions before we begin? Everything's going to work pretty much exactly the same way it did for you on the show. Okay. Uh, the only difference is we do not have a time limit, so we will play. I had heard some rumblings about maybe we would take a look at doing question answering on a big scale. And maybe we would look at doing something that could take on a real challenge, like Jeopardy. Deep search and deep analytics was becoming a tougher and tougher problem for general purpose computers. So we said, well, let's build a specialized computer to do this and do it at an incredibly fast rate. Let's take a look at our categories. Philosophic ideas, Bergopolis. Ultimately, we're not playing Jeopardy. 
What we're trying to do is make computers better at processing all that natural language content. Can you imagine computers communicating more fluently in natural language? In 1778, this man, the elder, suffered a fatal collapse minutes after speaking against colonial independence. Watson. Who is William Pitt? That is correct. So Watson wins the game. It is irresistible to pursue this, because as we pursue understanding natural language, we pursue the heart of what we think of when we think of human intelligence. It is irresistible to pursue it. And uh, if you watched, uh, you can come out of the Wayback Machine now. We're, we'll stay in the present for a while. Um, if you watch the game show, you know it took a room full of computers to be able to do, to do that. And now it's available on the cloud. So, you know, the, uh, a lot of advances you're going to hear about the rest of this presentation, you know, sort of what's been going on in healthcare since Jeopardy. But this is really about, you know, how we interact with information. I mean, you could say computers, but it's really information. At the end of the day, we want to bring the best insights to the point of care that we can. And this is a, a cognitive computing is all about that. I mean, this is, you know, uh, uh, a lot of different definitions on, on what that means. Now, <clears throat> I've been blogging about this, as uh, Jeff was kind enough to mention. And if you are tweeting or, you know, want to check that out, here's the uh, information. It's, uh, these charts will be made available, and uh, that'll be in there. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to introduce you to cognitive computing. We're going to talk about why it matters in healthcare, and then talk about you know what's next, some of the ways that it's being used today. Um, we are entering a new era of computing, right? If you remember going back before 1982, some people may remember punch cards. Of uh, you know, you know that that's how it all got started, right? N calculating numbers, advanced f calculators, if you will. We went into the programmable systems era because we got memory and networks and storage devices, and you know that's how you could start to program things. And now we're entering a new era. So this is a definition I grabbed off the internet. It, it uh, basically says that it's a new way to interact with information and systems cognitively, and that it uses technologies like machine learning and algorithm or algorithms, analytics, big data, and so forth. Um, but this is based on the fact that we as humans communicate unstructured. We do verbally and we do in our writing, in our text. Right? This is how we express emotion. It's how we, you know, smiley face is a form of uh, unstructured text. Right? So think about what that means within the context of, of, of a piece of information. But if you're a doctor and you're trying to deliver care on a patient and you, got, and you have to look through dozens, hundreds of pages of medical information to figure out what's the most relevant information to you at this moment in time about this patient who's in front of you who you've never seen before, and you've got to, and this person's chief complaint is, you know, heart pain, and somewhere in their medical history is an ejection fraction value that you're looking for to tell you something about how much blood this patient's heart is actually pumping, and you've got to find it, and it's not where it's supposed to be, what are you going to do? Right, well, what you probably do is just order another test to get the ejection fraction value when the reality is there's one that's three weeks old that's in there, you just couldn't find it in the form. Um, but this is what unstructured data looks like, right? It's messy, it's not in the right places, it's unstructured, right? So the trick, as you saw in the video, is how do we find what we're looking for when we're looking for that particular thing? Contextually relevant information. Anybody find the ejection fraction value up there, by the way? It was up there, it's 50. Uh, so why is, this, why is this so hard, right? Chess, which was alluded to in the game, is a math game, right? If I, if I, if I, use the, if I just to say the number five to you, everybody in the room knows what I'm talking about. It comes after four, it comes before six. Five plus five always equals tens. Five minus five always equals zero. There's nothing ambiguous about five in any language, right? The game of chess is exactly the same way. There are rules, there are numbers, you can move a certain number of spaces, each piece has rules that govern what they do, and so forth. Right? To, to, to conquer ch uh, chess was just about programming. Right? Human language is completely different. If I, just, if I use the word major and stop right there, probably about a third of you will think of a military context, someone's title. A third of you 
will think of a musical context, type of note, or, hey, we're going to major on this. It's a form of expression or an adjective, right? It's, it's, it implies an action. So the point is, is um, you need to understand what else is going on around the word major if you really want to understand the correct usage of that term in that situation. And what if the, the, the words is not in front of it? It has a completely different meaning. Complaining of heart pain, complaining of, uh, of uh, shortness of breath, but does not show certain things, right? So getting the negative and the positive intonation of an item is critical. This is all expressed in text. This is why this is a big computing problem. So we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll check out the audience here, right? So remember to answer in the form of a question. Our topic is world history. In May 1898, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer's arrival in India. Anyone? Who is Marco Polo is incorrect. Anybody else? Good guess, though. If you had said, who is Vasco da Gama, <laughs> you would have been correct. So now this is an actual Jeopardy question. And this was the kinds of training questions that we use to train the system. And if you just search, you go to your favorite search tool and type in that question, what you will, you're, you're searching a lot of information that's out there. Almost all of it's unstructured. A lot of it is not trusted. So, the, so you bring in the concept of what information is trustworthy here. This is a big deal. Because on the internet, if you ask the internet this question, you would conclude that Gary actually uh, was who was celebrated. And unfortunately, Gary was just some schmo who was on vacation and was blogging about it. But he had the same keywords that were in, in the question, which is why it's not Gary. Uh, you have to use advanced analysis. You have to use the advanced analytics and algorithms that people have been talking about. And when it comes from unstructured information, you're using things like reasoning and inference and negation and geospatial analysis. It's, it's a whole nother, whole nother level. Um, and this partially explains why it's taken you know, all these years to, to do this. So we've been working on innovation in healthcare for a long time. Um, you know, the company's been around over 100 years now, but we started on this particular problem in 1957 when we published our first research in that, and we have been innovating around natural language processing, text analytics, and unstructured information all along, all along the way. Um, so with that, we're gonna bring it to the present, and uh, this was a recent TED Talk, done in support of a recent TED Talk for um, where, we are, where we are today. I think we need some make sense of it and make better decisions. Now, those of you that watch us, we don't At IBM, we're seeing a new era of computing, starting with the tabulating era, then to the programmable computer era, and now cognitive computing systems, which expand the boundaries of human cognition, become smarter with use, and have a much more natural interaction between the human and the computer. In the area of artificial intelligence, there were a lot of amazing ideas, but computational capabilities just weren't ready for them. Watson suddenly makes some of these crazy ideas possible. At the core, we're trying to leverage knowledge the way humans record and communicate it, natural human language, and in particular, text. Its initial introduction to the world was as a competitor on the Jeopardy quiz show in the healthcare space, we're approaching it as a support tool to expand the physician's cognitive boundaries by giving them deeper access to much larger volumes of information. The history associated with the patient, the journal articles, clinical results, best practice guidelines, etc. That volume of content is doubling every five years. Physicians have precious little time to keep up with everything. A system like Watson can leverage the computer's ability to deal with huge volumes of data, understand the knowledge that's contained within this data, apply it to the problem that the physician is trying to solve, give them different alternatives to consider, and in particular, the underlying evidence that supports those alternatives. That basic problem-solving pattern 
applies to a wide variety of industries. Any area where you have complex problems that you're trying to solve, or adapting the computer technology to work better with the way humans want to work so that it's a more natural relationship between the human and the computer. 2011, 2011, we introduced a new era to you. And mm. it is the third. Bear with me a sec. Thank you. Okay, so since, since we started this journey, we've had a lot of uptake. There's been a lot of interest in this, and I know there was interest in this, in this topic today. Um, many case studies pu uh, published. I'm going to take you through a couple on um, how this is being applied today. And, and Watson is not just this big, giant thing that sits in the cloud that people can access. There's been a number of specific solutions built out that uh, are targeted at specific problems. One of the early spaces was oncology. Uh, for a lot of reasons, that was one of the first uh, sort of real complex domains. We, uh, we targeted that, and as you can see by some of the names here, there are lots of different capabilities or solutions uh, in support of this. So why are we, why are we doing this? Um, you, you know, we're obviously an industry that's going through a transformation. Um, but the two things to me that, that matter here, I, I think that we're focused on, is the triple aim, of course, everyone's focused on. But... One of the challenges is around knowledge, right? The doctors spend less than five hours a month reading their um, medical journals as, as self-reported in, in, in uh, you know, uh, recent surveys. And in order to meet the requirements laid down for, you know, staying up with your uh, obligations in that area, it would take 21.7 hours every day. If, if you were to read every single thing that you're supposed to read, right? It's impossible. You know, if you were reading all day, you'd never actually do your job, of course, or sleep or eat or any of that. So it's, a, it's, it's an unsolvable problem, right? And unless you can use this information, if you can mimic this cognitive capability that we have as humans, if we can provide decision support tools that enable that information to be presented in context when, when we need it. Um, the other thing is, you know, all the talk this morning about big data, massive data, little data, all these things, you got, we haven't seen anything. This is the tip of the iceberg. By the year 2020, medical information will double every 73 days if the current projections, every 73 days. The, 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 the world's known medical information today, every 73 days will double. So, when you start thinking about data warehouses and analytic models and these kinds of things, right, you, you got to plan for really, you know, it's unfathomable. And guess what? Over 80% of it is unstructured. So you better, you know, start figuring out the unstructured side. Um, you know, the, I, the, I don't need to go through that. The current, the current cost projections are, you know, are going to force change upon the entire industry, all of us. Um, at the end of the day, humans only have so much capacity, and it is not possible for us to read it all, assimilate it all, learn it all, and apply it all. We are going to need cognitive tools that help us do this. Um, and where's that data going to come from? It's going to come from these things, right? These Fitbits and watches and smartphones and sensors and this whole topic of the Internet of Things. Uh, if you haven't heard the term exogenous data, it means external data, things that you know, are, are, don't come from self, come from outside of self. And that's where all this a astronomical growth will come from in the future. Now, I want to talk a second about quality, because the other thing that's going on here is all of this data that's being created, and I think it's pretty obvious from the presenters earlier today, the way I look at it is it's an opportunity. right? The, the, all this data, this untapped data, is an opportunity for us to learn new things and maybe do a better job in areas that um, uh, there's, where there's room for improvement. Now, I, I think everyone would agree that the Mayo Clinic is probably about the best of breed uh, organization and what they do, but even they have, re uh, have, re have re uh, released reports where they show that they have reversed 40% uh, of their standards of care after analyzing them over an extended period of time. It turns out that they had it wrong in the first place. So data, as was shown in some of the earlier case studies today, is a way to shorten these time frames and um, deal with those kinds of issues. 
So our um, uh, role in healthcare here, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to play one more video and then uh, give you one example and then we'll take some questions. One day, this is the culmination of all this work. To be honest with you, I was emotional. I just thought about all the genius and all the talent Can of you, these researchers. I mean, they I don't know why we're, we're just having the same problem here, guys. I'll tell you what, I think I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip this video and go into the case study in that case. people standing behind Watson and that's just the core team there's a whole so what we're trying to do is um, bring all this information make it useful someone said this morning or said earlier on the last panel um, the last speaker talked about how if, if this were like oil um, you know it's more valuable out of the ground than where it can be refined and, and reused and so forth and that is a great example and this is what we're trying to help our clients do in healthcare right the data in its raw form can be analyzed where you can surface insights that things we didn't previously see. And those might be cognitive insights, they might be data-driven insights. Um, and then ultimately, let's use that information where it matters most, which is at the point of care, uh, so that we can prevent those things, you know, the, the point that was made about uh, anticipate and proactively prevent is right on the money. That's, that is absolutely what the future is about. It will drive down the costs without compromising safety. There is, there is no doubt about it. So what we've been doing in, in healthcare in particular is uh, making acquisitions, investing in new uh, technologies to build on top of Watson. Yeah, that's where all those solutions came from. We've made a number of acquisitions uh, of note. Curum is one around care management to allow us to take all these insights from these analytics and from these cognitive systems and apply them in those uh, care coordination type scenarios. We just recently announced an expansion of this effort uh, that Jeff talked about at the beginning. The Watson Health Group was formed, and with that we made two additional um, population health acquisitions, a company called Fitel, which is a patient-centered medical home solution, and Explorus, which is a big data organization. So Watson's not just about these big pie-in-the-sky ideas. It's about, you know, using unstructured information day in and day out to make better decisions. This is my favorite case study. Um, it's Seton Healthcare Family in Austin, Texas. They, they are um, part of Ascension. They serve a highly indigent population. And what they wanted to do was um, cut down on the waste, within, particularly within their charity care uh, program. And 30-day um, re readmissions was the target space that, um, that they went after. And interestingly enough, when the project started, you know, they, they came to the project with about 200 things that they thought for sure were causing 30-day readmissions. And they were very proud of their structured data um, and you know, how organized it was and the fact that they could get it all and, and so forth. And what we found out is that really the data that we thought would be useful wasn't. It turns out that the unstructured data was much more valuable than the structured data. And it turns out that in some cases, things like ejection fraction values, which are supposed to be in the EMR, weren't even in there. They had to go back to the original lab results to get the actual values. What they thought, those 200 items, was causing the readmissions wasn't. Um, they, uh, that list of 200 actually expand, expanded quite a bit, over, over 400, and we winnowed it back to the 18 most statistically significant factors that were causing readmissions, of which about half were on the original list, and about half were new things that their best minds you know, didn't have on their, their list of 200. And on that list of 200, about a third of those factors came from social determinants, social situations, things like, uh, you know, um, including, um, behavioral, including behavioral health in that. In one case, um, well, I'll just tell you the story. And then the other, the other last, important, last important point on that is, um, is we looked at it from cost, right? So patient X was somebody who came into the uh, ER six times over an eight-month period. And um, really, we looked at the data on patient X, and it was the same factors that were coming in. And it turns out that on the sixth encounter, they were coming in, treating him the same, sending, sending him or her back out, right? Same, same thing each and every time. Um, on the sixth encounter, someone finally asked some, some questions about the living situation for patient X. And they found out that patient X was, was self-medicating and really just sort of using that as a way not to deal with his or her problems. And once they got patient X into a uh, treatment program appropriate to the situation, then the, the readmissions stopped. And um, 
the, the impact here was that 83% of the costs associated with treating patient X came from the fact that um, uh, could have been avoided, rather, if we just asked a question on the first visit instead of the sixth visit. And this is where, this is a perfect example of where this information is hugely valuable because that piece of information was buried in the unstructured data. It wasn't being analyzed. You know, and, and you think about where does that information get captured? It's a caseworker somewhere who puts it in a note field somewhere and it usually gets missed. Um, so enormous opportunity to, um, to use uh, all of this information, particularly the unstructured data. And with that, we'll take a question or two, right? Two questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Right. Same category. No questions? Tom Simmer from Blue Cross. I'd like to just sort of ask a question that Dr. Jackson asked earlier. We, um, we seem to be tripping up over the very simplest of problems. Um, when patients need a mammogram, when patients are on a trajectory to um, suffer the need for dialysis, things that have fairly simple al algorithms escape our ability to put into practice. I'd wonder if you comment on, um, is it a different type of problem that we have to solve to, to get basic information about who needs an immunization and, and routine tests versus who helps us on the sort of diagnostic puzzles? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, it, it's never just a people problem. It's never just a process problem. It's never just a data problem. Um, since you mentioned um, uh, mammograms, so an example I didn't use was University of North Carolina um, was putting their test results into a text field in, in, their, uh, in one of their hospitals, in, in, into a text field. The problem is, is that the value is supposed to go somewhere else in the EMR, and that value, when it's placed in the right place in the EMR, triggers the follow-up action for, for people who have been determined, right? It's called the BIRAD system. It's a rating scale, and you're supposed to indicate what the... And based on the numeric value you put in there, that triggers action on the back end. Well, it's a human being who is supposed to put the numeric value in the right place, and they don't put it in the right place. So people who have been diagnosed with cancer don't get the follow-up action because of a workflow problem and human beings who aren't following what they're supposed to do. So sometimes the most simplest of things are teaching people to put the data in the right place. Uh, the unfortunate thing about, here's the dirty little secret about EMRs. The, the unfortunate thing that, when well, we're not an EMR vendor, so I can say this, um, is that the way they get implemented has more to do with how successful they are than the actual tool you pick. Um, and in um, many, many instances, the, in the quest to get problem lists and new structures and to get all the information in a specific order, they put so much complexity in front of the doc who has to enter all these things or the person supporting the doc that they, they start looking for the path, the, the path of least resistance to get the information in there. The doc's obligation is to get the information in there. So what do they do? They go look for the text fields. And they you know, dictate their note and it goes in as a text note. Well, then it's a self-propagating problem, right? So it's... This, I believe that the simple solutions lie at the intersection of people, process, and information. And if we looked at every problem from that perspective first, you could solve a lot of these things, right? Like the, the mammogram problem. Did that answer your question? One more? Yeah, Rick Nowakowski with Partners for Health. Uh, it seems as we adapt new technology across the range of uh, fields that we get into the new technology, we use it, we want to look to the human to say, is this valid and validate it before we go through a process to totally trust the new technology. How do you see that working with Watson getting into clinical care and that path from the physician having to be there to say, yep, check the box, they're right, to a more possibly independent Watson? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question. and. Um 
you know, the, the whole goal of, of Watson is not to be a doctor, right? There, initially, when we, people started talking, oh, we should call it Dr. Watson, and I said, no, that's crazy, because then people actually think it's a, a doctor. It's not a doctor. It's a decision support tool that mimics the way that the best doctors think, right? So we, that's why we have gone to places like Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson and Mayo Clinic and work with them to build out how it cognitively processes information. The goal is to give every doctor right, uh, access to a broader set of information so that they can make the right decision in that situation. It's not to replace, the, right? It's the doctor who only reads the four hours every month, right? And he misses the article on Lyme disease and some guy comes in who's from another part of the country who has Lyme disease and misdiagnosis, right? That's what we're trying to prevent is to, is to provide another way uh, to do decision support.